evening. I am Jerome Cornwall. I'm a licensed clinical social worker here at Advance Care, and I'm excited to be able to present this topic, uh, the effects of social isolation and the importance of staying involved, right? Now, just a little background on myself. Uh, I've been a clinical social worker for uh, almost a decade now. I've worked in different uh, spaces, including uh, foster care, including school uh, settings, school social work, working with children, working with adults. And right now I work, I specialize working with adults with uh, different issues and concerns, uh, including things like ADHD, um, depression, anxiety, and a myriad of other uh, diagnoses and concerns. So I'm uh, pleased to be here with you all this evening, and I hope that we can all gain something from this topic uh, to be able to use moving forward, especially in what's coming up to be our holiday season at the end of the year, right? So this topic is something, I, I think the timing is just right, right on the cusp at the time of this recording. It is uh, mid to late uh, October, and uh, next week is going to be Halloween, which kicks off the last quarter holiday season. And with all of that, we tend to look at some of these holiday situations as times to get together, right? Holistically and, you know, societally. And with that, we tend to sometimes overlook some people that don't have the same, say, fortunate situations um, as some of us, right? And so that tends to be social isolation, right? So one of the things I want to look at as we look at the definition definition of isolation, uh, isolation is the state of feeling alone and without friends or help, right? Which is synonymous with separation, withdrawal, loneliness, and segregation, right? So if a picture says a thousand words, right? Let's look at this picture for a second and look at what it's really saying to us in terms of what we can get from it. Uh, I definitely would like for you all to share as much as possible, you know, put in the chat uh, things that you notice and we will look at that together. Uh, just to share what I'm noticing, you'll see that this person is elderly. You'll see that this person is looking at obviously this pigeon uh, by herself. And one of the things that I noticed was the background is dark, right? There's nothing else that you can really see or depict in this, in this background, right? So the sense of feeling alone is definitely depicted here, right? Without friends or help, what does that look like? When we think about or look at people in different stages of life, we notice that the older people get, the more they are uh, set aside or they may feel set aside and they can feel alone. And uh, a lot of these situations comes from not having the same friends that they've had over the years. And that sometimes is a plight of, you know, that is, uh, uh, in tune with elderly people uh, mostly, but can also uh, hit other ranges of people, especially youth, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move along, right? So feeling alone without friends or help. A lot of times, regardless of your age, you're looking for help, and sometimes you can't see it or you can't you don't feel like you have any help around you right so a lot a lot of times we notice in, in the synonyms is that separation or withdrawal right 
Sometimes that can be voluntary. Sometimes it could be involuntary in terms of like segregation, right? Being set aside, whether it's by population or other tenants, right? Withdrawal, feeling like you have to, uh, you know, go back within yourself in order to feel maybe a sense of safety, right? So I think at this point, as we move forward to the next uh, slide, we're going to do a quick, uh, quick poll. When you feel disconnected, what's the first thing you notice about yourself, right? If we could have your know, participation, just answer these really quickly. And we'll look at some of the things that, you know, can help us feel disconnected. What do you all think? Withdrawal from social activities, spend more time alone or uh, online, uh, avoid reaching out to family and friends, feel anxious or down or, or about interacting with others. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. So although there may be some hesitation, give me just a moment. Although there may be some hesitation in uh, the poll, these are definitely some things that we can look at uh, that contribute to withdrawal and isolation, right? Withdrawal from social activities, uh, spending time online, avoiding reaching out to family and friends and feeling anxious or down about interacting with others. Okay, all right. So we'll go to our next slide and we'll talk about some of the problems that we notice. So here we have different aspects of what contributes to social isolation, right? Loneliness, social and emotional distance from family, coworkers, and neighbors, right? So here we have natural areas that you would see integration uh, and interaction in society. Family, right? Sometimes we notice that there are family members that are distant emotionally for a variety of reasons, right? What do you think some of those reasons could be, right? You definitely are welcome to put that in the chat. We could explore and look at it if you have any questions about any of these, right? So social and emotional distance from family, coworkers, and neighbors. Who are those people that you see in the office but you don't hear about or hear from? Who are those people in your neighborhood that seem to be the quiet family on, on your block or in your neighborhood, right? 
have you identified people that seem to keep to themselves, right? Maybe that could be something that you're uh, noticing or dealing with and loneliness can happen on a, a, a social level, on an emotional level for a variety of reasons. Fear-based avoidance influenced by anxieties or avoidant personality which prevent ability to build relationships. Fear, right? Fear, be fear becomes a barrier to addressing different things, even things that may seem normal and appropriate to others, right? In, in terms of anxiety, fear is often fueled by imagination, and that's what can what can create anxiety. And because of that, that creates all these scenarios that become overwhelming, right? Avoidant personality has often been uh, misaligned with uh, another uh, personality issue in, in uh, terms of uh, not being able to engage with others, right? And so some people find it difficult to be around people and will try to avoid even those, uh, the slightest of social situations, right? So some people call that antisocial or antisocial, but really antisocial personality disorder is something more aligned with law breaking or uh, ignoring people's uh, boundaries and personal space. So avoidant personality is more so uh, getting used to or having the personality of not wanting to engage or be around people in a social uh, effort, so to speak, right? And so that creates a difficulty in attaining or maintaining relationships as a whole, okay? So what does that mean? It means that there can be a difficulty with adjusting. So difficulty adjusting when changes occur, especially either from location or empty nesting. If anybody here has ever moved, whether it's across country, whether it's to attend school of some sort or because their job uh, requires that they move or they, they've gained a, a, you know, a new position, it could be a change that really you have to adjust to. And there's more than just adjusting to that job. There's adjusting to your social situation, right? Another thing that parents have to address that sometimes doesn't come up later in, in life is how are we gonna adjust to empty nesting? Because you have approximately, you know, depending on your situation, 18 or 18 plus years that you've been with this person raising, protecting, providing for this child that is now entering adulthood and has learned a sense of independence, hopefully, right? So what does that mean? It means something for them, but it also means something for the parents, right? Not only the parents, but those that they're associated with, right? The, the child that's, associated, that's turning into an adult that has to uh, associate with making adjustments from maybe high school, middle school, you know, gaining independence and having to learn a whole new cycle, right? Difficulty adjusting, right? That can lead to a sense of overwhelm as well and regression or withdrawal into yourself and not wanting to feel embarrassed or not wanting to uh, put yourself in a position that is too much for you right? A lot of what we have to deal with comes from the perception of what's in front of us, right? So the next one, online fixation. 
lack of awareness with overutilization of internet usage without appropriate or reasonable caution. That could also translate to online dependence. So a lot of the things that we do are heavily invested in, in online interaction. Whether we're talking about our jobs, whether we're talking about making plans, whether we're talking about uh, different types of engagement, if we become overly dependent on online fixation or internet usage, we can decrease our level of interaction, whether it's online, uh, not online, but whether it's in person, rather. And so that can be problematic if we forget how to socialize, right? That can definitely be dependent, especially when we grow into this, this sense of internet usage, right? So online fixation, as well as anything else, needs to have a sense of balance. Self-esteem. Self-esteem here, we're, we're addressing our strong feelings of inadequacy, fear of rejection, and criticism, right? So you'll often notice that this comes about whenever discussing social anxiety, right? Which is a big proponent of isolation, right? The fear or strong feelings of inadequacy, not wanting to be rejected, and so that withdrawal is a defense mechanism against that rejection or that perceived rejection or perceived criticism. So your self-esteem becomes problematic when it takes that hit and you're, you're looking at it from the standpoint of, I don't want this discomfort or pain. And so I need to protect myself, right? Loneliness, fear-based avoidance, difficulty adjusting, online fixation, and self-esteem, right? What do you associate with? And I think we're coming up with our next poll. Right, your participation is encouraged. Please answer these questions and we'll share that, that or those answers with you. If you had to step outside your comfort zone today, what would be your next move? Joining a new group or activity, starting a conversation with someone new, trying something I've always been afraid to do, reflecting on what is holding me back. Okay. All right. So as you think about this, what stands out to you? Is it being a part of a group that will allow you to socialize or starting a new conversation with someone, starting a conversation with someone new? And sometimes people think, well, I don't want to talk to this person because of that fear of rejection. Well, a conversation doesn't have to always be the deepest conversation, right? We can look at areas that, you know, it can be a, a really superficial uh, conversation starter or uh, very limited small talk. Right, any other answers? We have identified uh, one response that, that lets us know it's more about joining a new group or activity. All right, so. All right, and we'll move on here.
Okay. So here's something interesting that I'd like to share with you in terms of what are we noticing about how this looks, right? From maybe an internal point of view. So we have here a layer, a layering of different zones. And what you'll see is uh, comfort zone, fear zone, learning zone, and growth zone. So when you look at it from this standpoint, as it states here, in that comfort zone, what we're seeing is safe and in control. That's where you feel safe and in control because it provides what? Low risk and low reward, right? So if I don't have to put myself in, say, a strange situation, that's low risk of feeling or having feelings that I don't want to have to address or deal with, right? So essentially, that base zone becomes the comfort zone. So even though you can get something out of that, like a sense of control, it also keeps you furthest away from participation and in integration, right? And so that keeps us what we call isolated or hidden, right? So when we look at, I apologize, it's my lack of movement that's making this room think I'm not here. So forgive me if I have to do that every, ever so often. Uh, when we look at the next zone, the fear zone, right? Before we look at that, Think about in your comfort zone, what is your default for feeling safe, right? And what creates that sense of safety, right? In your comfort zone, when you ask yourself this, these questions, you help to identify things that are possible to change, right? Now, the fear zone, uh, it identifies low self-confidence, it actually finds excuses to remand you to that zone, right? And you feel you can feel affected by others' opinions. Fear zone that is immediately outside of your comfort zone that creates that barrier that keeps you on the inside and want to, you know, stay within that, that comfort zone. The fear zone uh, understands struggles, recognizes, uh, it helps you to recognize barriers, who or what is controlling your thoughts. So that fear zone includes the identification of, well, what's controlling my thoughts? What's keeping me in this space, right? Uh, so this is where if you can identify and push towards the next zone, learning zone, you start to look at overturning these issues, right? You have to face challenges, you have to problem solve, and that helps you acquire new skills and extend your comfort zone, right? So you can help change that comfort zone from a safety being okay, I can't do something, to safety being I can do something, right? So face challenges. Guess what? Every person that's, it, that's viewing this or in here today has faced challenges. You didn't always walk. You didn't always talk. You didn't always figure out shapes, numbers, and speech uh language, speech and language patterns and things of that nature. However, depending on your, your level of integration and cognition, you are in a different place than where you started. Facing challenges and problem solve, it does not have to be something complex. When you acquire new skills, you gain new confidence, right? For those parents out there, Remember when your child first learned how to navigate stairs, first learned how to navigate 
uh, different things in the home, different games, right? What do you think when they first started putting together sentences, right? It extends their comfort zone. And so that's where you learn more about yourself. You learn how to integrate different things that are helpful to you. And you learn how to push those boundaries, right? That comfort zone, that feeling of safety and control. And you learn to work with and address risks and have more something positive feed in terms of feedback for those rewards. Growth zone, this is where you find your purpose. This is where you start to dream and live and uh, really set new things up, right? You set new goals, you con conquer objectives, um, and you learn to identify, create, identify, achieve, and pro progress, right? Or progress uh, in terms of different things that you're learning and doing. This helps you, like uh, the previous zone says, to re, uh, rezone that comfort zone, right? To recreate that comfort zone, identify new areas of growth, all right? So we're learning that some of the solutions here are how to close that gap from that comfort zone to our growth zone, right? and help to create a healthier uh, space for us to grow and reside, right? So what are some of the things that we can do to accommodate that? Well, the target audience can be something that's helpful. Becoming more engaged with community involvement. Why community involvement? It creates a more eclectic space for us to find things and people and uh, uh, places that we can associate with that makes it a more comfortable transition, right? So for different communities, it can be agencies, it could be uh, something that's within the communities. A lot of communities next week are very involved in uh, the Halloween process. And they try to make it safe as possible. And, and, you know, they may use different things like the mall to have uh, places for people to congregate and safely, um, uh, you know, celebrate Halloween. And there may be other engagements, right? Starting not just on that holiday, but in upcoming holidays uh, that your community may be involved in, right? Some people have friends giving, church groups, right? Hobbies like art or, or other hobbies. Uh, some people have joined clubs, right? Cost saving, having effective, cost-effective solutions can increase the likelihood of engagement. Everything doesn't have to be cost prohibitive. Everything does not have to be the fanciest thing in order for it to mean something to someone, right? Part of what can be restrictive is, well, you know, how much does this thing cost? If I want to go to a concert and, and this is my favorite artist, is it costing an arm and two legs? Right? Also creating a budget for periodic activities that helps you find something to look forward to. Not only you, but also those that are, are, let's say within your household or friend group, right? That helps you to identify things instead of saying, well, I can only take this person. Let's do something inclusive. Let's create something that includes other people. Overall well-being, having the ability to address areas uh, such as physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, social, and professional engagement enhances wellness. Well, think about this concept of overall well-being. 
if you've thought about self-care, then you've thought about well-being. Those are also interchangeable, right? Because when you look at well-being, it will always encompass some sort of self-care. And so when you think about self-care, you don't have to think about it in terms of it has to be just for me. It's not always self-care doesn't equal selfish, right? It can be inclusive. So physical self-care does not have to be attained all by yourself. Emotional and psychological self-care does not have to be attained all by yourself. You get to decide what that looks like. And you could also be inclusive of other people that help you to facilitate and address those areas, right? Spiritual, social, and professional engagement. Part of professional engagement includes your interaction with others, right? Your colleagues, your coworkers, right? And it's on different level levels. Everybody is not going to be your closest friend but it doesn't mean you can't smile and feel good in that space, right? It doesn't mean you can't interact and have a pleasant conversation with other people in your workspace, in your day-to-day -day, uh, social engagement, okay? So social engagement, the relationship of participation and involvement and its impact on the quality of life. So isn't that important, quality of life? So when we look at the relationship of participation and involvement, it's suggesting here that you need to be uh, a participant and involved in different things to have an active impact on your quality of life. So activity is really the antithesis of depressive symptoms. Whenever we're working on depression, you'll always notice activity is always suggested and encouraged. So social engagement helps to address that and also helps to address different things like uh, fighting isolation and things of that nature. So it's often helpful and necessary to understand your relationship with participation because you may have a particular concern that the person next to you may not have, right? And there may be a specific way for you to address that, to resolve it, and now become uh, a more engaged participant in the things that are going on around you, right? Instead of feeling like you have to isolate. So some of the things that come to mind, right? When we're looking at this, right? Person-centered uh, involvement, um, things that are shared, I know it might look a little small. It says culture uh, in there, above monitoring, engaged, cold design, uh, design uh, self-referral, uh, collaboration. These are some of the words that come up when we're, we're talking about social engagement and involvement, right? Is there anything else that you all would think of that would allow us to expand this list, All right? If so, feel free to put it in the chat, right? We'll welcome that and talk about that as well. Transitions, feedback, preferences. To say you have preferences is to identify things that would often help you propel yourself into Okay, these are for, these are ideas that I can work with. These are ideas that I can cultivate, right? So, involvement, uh, shared, whether it's uh, shared design or monitoring, all of these things help you 
to create that sense of engagement. And it helps your imagination and your uh, problem solving skills to address things like, you know, isolation or feeling alone or feeling like you uh, may not uh, be in the right place or the right space, right? So it's definitely worth understanding what comes to mind when you think about these things, because social isolation will actually work towards suppressing your, your imagination in ways that could be helpful to you because your comfort zone is not trying to allow for risk to take place. So we look at some of these things as negative when actually your uh, ability to identify ways to become involved is actually trying to problem solve, right? That's where we have, you know, that dissonance, that pushback, because we start to notice something does not feel right, right? And that's because of, you know, a sense of, okay, well, what I was doing before when I didn't feel uh, isolated or separated or uh, when I had more friends, it does not matter how far back you go, right? What we notice is participation and uh, involvement helps to create healthy bonding, especially in children, right? So that's not something that you're supposed to grow out of naturally, right? You're supposed to develop that. So even though you have a sense of maturity about yourself, it does not mean you grow into a sense of isolation. Okay, so a path, getting involved, right? A path is made by walking on it. What does that mean? Well, let's look at children and adolescents as uh, previously stated. This There is an increase, uh, increasing body of evidence showing that regular exercise has unquestionable physical, social, and psychological benefits contributing to general health and well-being. So starting with children and adolescents, this is a part of their natural environment. Right. So one of the things that was discussed a lot during COVID was how is this going to affect the children, not to mention the families, but how is this going to affect the children? And of course, as we progressed and got through, uh, I guess, the greater part of that experience, we started to look at how are we going to integrate, reintegrate our children back in in a safe way, in a way where they can feel like they are getting what they need from their space, right? And so this is one of the things that really uh, has been identified for general health and well-being with children and adolescents. Older women are more likely, I found this interesting, older women are more likely than men to report having a satisfactory relative network. Why do you think that is? Older women are more likely than men to report having a satisfactory relative network, right? Meaning their, their connection with relatives uh, is more satisfactory. Maybe that's because of the level of health, uh, healthy relationships, uh, rather, that they have with their relatives, right? Uh, and that creates that network, right? So that's something to think about. That uh, is that something that you're experiencing? Is that something that you have heard of or even seen a pattern of? Uh, everybody wants to go see grandma. Everybody wants to go see, you know, their aunt, their mom, things of that nature. What are we? What are we looking at here? 
Older men are more likely to be members of social clubs, but less likely to be involved in an education, art, or music group, right? So what does that mean? What does it mean for men to be involved in social groups? Is it something that starts from a specific age? It's something to think about when you're uh, in different groups as you're growing up, not only what you notice, but uh, what you may have experienced, right? Social groups are also things that you can look forward to uh, in terms of creating social engagement, right? And so that's something that I think is also beneficial when we're considering uh, how to address what we're doing to really rectify uh, withdrawal or uh, social disengagement at various points, right? So here's one strategy, right? Uh, when we're addressing our competition with ourselves, the hopefully the end goal is the reaction that this uh person is having right this young lady seems you know very engaged or, or happy right and so what are we looking at here one of the strategies that a lot of therapists may utilize uh is therapeutic strategy for motivational interviewing motivational interviewing is utilized to help guide and understand and address and sometimes uh, break down those barriers, right? Of what's stopping us, what's stopping us. And so what we look at when we look at motivational interviewing is how to revisit uh, different things that create these barriers and how to revise and adapt revise and adapt. So sometimes when you revisit, you'll revisit a better part of who you are and that helps you to address, well, what helped in this situation that could be pertinent now in the present, right? Trying different things is always a part of change. Trying different things, so trying, right? That creates success versus failures. So what we saw during, uh, you know, when, when we're looking at our change, uh, our, our ability to move forward uh, towards that growth area, uh, we're looking at some of the challenges that are created by the failures, right? And the next one that talks about rolling with resistance that resistance is very much so internally, right? It can happen internally. So whether it's you that is experiencing uh, experiencing this from time to time, or you find that someone else that you're concerned about is resistant, that's a part of their process, right? And so the process, it's almost... Uh, you know, where if you hit a certain barrier, you may have to go back a couple of steps and start and push back in order to advance. So sometimes you may have to hit resistance and then go back to what was working and what didn't work and then try that again to overcome that resistance. And that helps you to support self-efficacy, right? So your goal is to be able to move as you want to move, do as you want to do, be progressive as you want to be. And so that helps you with your, your advancement overall. So think about that when we, when we move and address different things, right? So staying involved, getting involved and then staying involved. Staying involved also addresses identifying a list of positive character uh, traits to build self-esteem, right? So you're building. Everything that you do contributes to your building. 
And your positive character traits often do that, right? So your positive character traits can sometimes be overshadowed by your current sense of self. The good thing is that you can look at anywhere in your, your history, your past. Remember, we talked about some of the early stages, anything from walking, talking, um, gaining friends, being able to move from one platform to another. It could be great. It could be uh, tenure in your at your job. It could be ability to get promoted. All of these things are positive character traits that you can utilize to build, build upon, right? Identify defense mechanisms such as inferiority, shame, uh, and fear of rejection. Um, and of course, fear of rejection and fear, shame, and inferiority and humiliation reinforce these barriers that make us feel like I have to have a, a, a I have to stay in my comfort zone and my comfort zone uh, helps me to ignore some of these things, right? Following through with work, family, and social activities rather than escaping and avoiding uh, to focus on anxiety, right? So if you are the one that notices someone is having challenges with getting out or reducing their social isolation and you you keep on inviting them out keep on inviting them out because they continually need uh opportunities for outlets right if you are the one that's continually trying to overcome uh difficulties and barriers keep on trying keep on looking for different solutions follow through if you say you're going to attend right? Attend. Even if you have to attend incrementally, meaning I'll stay for 30 minutes, I'll stay for uh, maybe an hour, I'll show my face, I'll say hello, and I'll take my leave. Sometimes that is a better sense of integration than jumping in and saying, okay, I'm going to go to um, a 20,000 person concert, right? Maybe that may may not be always the, the best first move, but you can probably progress to that. So here we will look at, you know, as you look at change, positive self-talk, resources, and therapy. How you talk to yourself and how you talk about yourself is always important. Insights that identify supportive traits for change. You can identify insights that support um, uh, your traits for change, right? How you talk about yourself is always important. How you hear yourself talk about yourself is always important. So resources include different techniques that you may pick up. Hopefully you're picking up some here. Uh, you may pick up something from some knowledgeable family or friends or co-workers or other groups that you have interest in, right? And of course, a supportive factor here is therapy, uh, therapy where you are able to collaborate and partner uh, in a space that helps to motivate you and where you can recognize and manage challenges, right? So recognition is always a step step that helps you to address things appropriately, okay? So as we end off for today, I wanna thank you all uh, for participating to this point. And I'll say by closing the gap between social isolation and social engagement, we create the opportunity to enable benefits of physical health, and improve mental health and decrease feelings of depression and anxiety, right? So what does that mean? Social cohesion provides support and civic participation provides community. The overall sense of well-being is also fostered and supported. 
So that's the goal to increase these positive factors that are helping you to have an overall sense of well-being and support, right? So I want to thank you all for uh, sticking with us till the end of this presentation. Uh, just want to encourage you to reach out if you need any more support and also continue to think about different ways that you can find yourself in the positive end of, of, of growth and well-being. All right. Again, my name is Jerome Cornwall, uh, and you can find me and, and uh, others that can support you at Advanced Care. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Any questions? All right, I think that if we are okay here, and I'm not seeing any questions at this point, I guess that will do it for us this evening. Now, sometimes questions come at a later point, a later date. Please feel free to contact us. Uh, J Cornwall, C O R N W A L L at Advanced Care. And if you want to meet with or address any issues or concerns, please feel free to contact us. You can contact us and inquire about uh, support. All right, thank you, I appreciate uh, the thumbs up. All right, I think that'll do it for I think that'll do it for us this evening. And thank you all for showing uh, your support and enjoy your evening. We'll stop here for today.